Hello and welcome everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome back to the Arabian Travel Market. This is the first in-person travel event in 18 months and I think we're all thrilled to be here. Um, we're going to be talking of course about Saudi Arabia and all of the exciting developments that are happening inside the kingdom in spite of the fact that the world had to shut down for the last 18 months. A lot of things have been going on and we're excited to talk about them. I want to introduce my panelists, um, Jerry Anzarillo, who probably needs no introduction. He's the CEO of the Daria Gate Development Authority. Um, John Pagano, he's the CEO of Red Sea Development a Company and Amala. Andrew McAvoy, head of the tourism sector at NEOM. And joining us um, virtually, because you've got to have one virtual guest, I think, in all of these. Hello, good to see you. This is Melanie D'Souza. She's Executive Director, Tourism and Destination Marketing for the Royal Commission of Al Ula. Welcome, panelists. It's great to have you guys. I think that one of the things that we have been focusing on throughout this day, um, speaking to the CEOs of airlines, talking to folks around the world, has been the response um, for various, from various sectors to COVID-19. And obviously, in spite of the fact that the rest of the world hasn't been able to move around that much over the last 18 months or so. In Saudi Arabia, domestic tourism was booming by comparison, which is a really interesting development, something that perhaps people wouldn't have thought would be happening. I want to kick off with Jerry, though, just to walk us through where we were the last time you and I met, which is about two years ago, when you announced Algeria, and we're welcoming folks for the very first time to where we are today. What's changed and developed? Thank you. Wonderful to see you. Thank you, everybody, for coming out to uh, to welcome us. It's uh, always a pleasure to be back with my colleagues in person. I, I've missed uh, John and Andrew and everybody, so uh, Amr and Alula, so nice to be with everybody. Uh, when you were kind enough to visit with us, we called that the inception phase. So we had to put together um, our board, our staff, which will be 950 people by the end of this year, 80% Saudi, 36% Saudi women, 16% of those Saudi women in management, 11% from Derea. So we're very proud about that. And we had to go through what all the CEOs have, conceptual master planning, approved completely by the chairman who is the crown prince, into detailed master planning, into engineering, and breaking ground. So the one thing that all of us are proud of is that our giga projects and Derea are on time, on budget, and we'll be producing our first assets as quickly as the first quarter of 2021, uh, 2022. That's incredible movement, isn't it? And it's also obviously very much in line with the Saudi Vision 2030, and not just bringing um, all of these young people into the workforce, but really bringing women into the workforce as well, and as you mentioned, in management roles at Alderia. John, when you think about this with regards to what's been happening in terms of the Red Sea development, most of us would not have thought a couple of years ago that we would actually be considering vacationing on the Red Sea in Saudi Arabia. But then the pictures started to emerge all over Instagram and social media of just how beautiful and untouched this part of the world really is. Where are you today? Well, thank you for having me and uh, thank you everybody for attending. Um, look, I think it's one of the best kept secrets in the world. I mean, we describe the Red Sea as one of the world's last hidden treasures, and it's no exaggeration. I think the images uh, bear that out. Um, we're moving steadfastly towards opening and welcoming our first guest by the end of next year, which uh, we opened the first three hotels. And then the following year, we're going to open up another 13 hotels. So in, in total, 16 hotels, 3,000 hotel rooms, but a new international airport a new coastal village that will be home to the 14,000 people that will work at the destination in that first phase. Um, we're making steadfast progress on site. I mean, today we're laying the asphalt onto the new international airport runway today, the very first thing, which is uh, you know, re really exciting for me personally. Um, we've committed over 15 billion real in contracts to date. Um, we've awarded a large-scale public-private partnership to build the largest renewable energy infrastructure for a tourism destination anywhere in the world. We are powered 100% by renewable energy 24 hours a day, which has never been attempted before. We're installing the largest battery storage system in the world to date. So, I mean, super progress, great, great, uh, great progress towards opening up and, and welcoming our first guests at the end of next year. Incredible. Andrew, um, first of all, when do I get my invitation to visit NEOM, as Hadley Gamble from CNBC? And two, I, I want one. You're not leaving without giving me one. And also, where are you guys within your project today? Because there's been a lot of media speculations about um, how quickly all of the things that the Crown Prince had asked for could actually be accomplished. Where is NEOM today? 
So first of all, consider yourself invited. Correct. So no drama. I, I agree with please. Jerry and John. It's great to be here. It's great to see humans face to face again in this industry. We're a people to people industry. So just to touch base with people is fantastic. Look, Neom, uh, like with Jerry and John and also Melanie with Alula, is well advanced on its master planning. Uh, it's, a, it's a big place. A lot of these places that are the Giga projects have big physical spaces. Probably the difference with Neom, tourism is one of 14 big sectors. It's scale, but it's also diversity. It's the future of everything. Neo, new, Mustak Bell, the first letter being M in the Arabic word for future. Everything is futuristic. So think about Star Wars, Avatar, Blade Runner. It's science fiction literally brought to life. But it's also about you know, and John has been great on this, can we solve some of the world's problems? Before COVID, this over-tourism word had really crept in, and I think we're all thinking about not just life beyond COVID, but even before that, consumers were much more focused on my food miles, my travel miles. So I think we're really trying to build a regenerative tourism offering in Neom, and I know in these other places as well. So we're well advanced in our planning. We've broken ground on a lot of things, and a bit like Jerry and John, First assets, end of 2022, and then really ramping up from there. But you are invited. You're welcome. Hooray. Now, one destination that I have visited, obviously, is Al Ula. I, I went a couple of years ago when I went out to see Jerry as well at Al Daria. Melanie, where is the Al Ula project today? Because when I was there a couple of years ago, we had one hotel development and not so regular service from Riyadh um, up to Al Ula. In fact, I had to take a private plane to get in and out. Walk us through how far you've come over the last couple of years. Oh. So first off, Hadley, you have a standing invitation to return to Alola <laughs> anytime. Um, but can I just say on the back of two very successful winter Tantora festivals, no doubt um, the opportunity that you then took to visit, um, we had a great celebration of everything from culture to art to sport to heritage, which is really at the core of our DNA. And we formally opened the doors to our destination as a year-round destination last year in October. We've already seen 80,000 visitors come through the doors um, in the last calendar year. And if you think about us, um, essentially we're a place synonymous with 200,000 years of human history. Um, we're a place that has called, um, uh, you know, ancient civilizations have called home over the millennia. Um, it's been uh, synonymous with the incense and trading routes. And not just are we happy to sit and rest on our laurels, but in the context of recent announcements, the Journey Through Time Master Plan will really set, if you like, the blueprint for what is a very ambitious plan for both built infrastructure, but also the largest um, cultural oasis regeneration of its kind in the world. So we're, just as Jerry, John, and Andrew have talked about sustainability, we're very keen that Alola is built as a case study with the correct principles as it re uh, relates to not just preserving and protecting, but ensuring that posterity can really enjoy what um, millennia, uh, civilizations over the millennia have left us. I think it's really interesting to think about um, the Saudi tourism market, not just in terms of the international appeal, something that's really not been seen or touched before, but also the domestic appeal as well. Um, my earlier panel, we had the CEO of Saudi, and he was saying, you know, expect some more plane orders in the future. We're going to have a lot of demand. And that's not just external demand, that's internal demand as well. The Al Daria project, for example, what does that bring to the Saudi community, to Riyadh in particular? What's the attraction? Yeah, it's, um, it's very emotional because it's the birthplace of the kingdom. It's the birthplace of the Arabian Peninsula. It's the house of Al Saud. So for all Saudis, there's a great sense of pride, and you know this, we always put our finger up and say there's only one Dereya. And what's happening now is that because we do that, people stop me and want to do selfies with that. And the reason why they want to do selfies has nothing to do with me. They're proud of Dereya. It's their birthplace. So to have the birthplace of the kingdom in its principal city, which the Crown Prince gave a very dynamic speech a few weeks ago because of the Royal Commission of Riyadh City, taking Riyadh to be one of the 10 most important cities in the world, going from 7 million to 15 to 20 million people. The fact that we, like Alula, are culture, heritage, but the birthplace of the kingdom in the middle of the principal city one of the five UNESCO World Heritage Sites, many more to come. 
Thanks to His Highness Prince Badr, our amazing uh, Minister of Culture, and Ahmed Al Khatib, our uh, wonderful uh, Minister of uh, Tourism. So this is important because there's a lot of Saudi national pride, and everybody sees the day as their home. So this is very important. We'll welcome people from all over the world. But really, Dedea belongs to the world, but principally for Saudis to reconnect to their cultural heritage. John, how many of um, the folks do you think that you'll see coming and enjoying the Red Sea Project or Saudi nationals versus an international appeal there? Because it's a really interesting area. Frankly, you've got Jordan, you've got Egypt as well. It's a confluence of countries in that part of uh, Saudi Arabia and the western coast of Saudi Arabia. How do you see that evolving? Well, look, I think the market, we, we anticipate that the, that the visitors will be coming probably 50% from international source markets and 50% domestically and regionally. I mean, um, are we going to get to a point where we're seeing yacht shows and glamorous you know, venues? What does it look like to you? Well, look, uh, the, the, the projects are different. So Red Sea is more you know, tuned into nature. I think you know, the regenerative tourism or regenerative sustainability story is really what the Red Sea is all about. It's about taking something that is pristine and unique and untouched and try to, try to develop it in a manner that is um, really, I guess, Sir David Attenborough's uh, comment that says we need to you know, move away from being apart from nature to becoming a part of nature once again, really resonates with us because you know, we want to have a light footprint on the destination. So it's, it's about being in touch with nature. So everything is downplayed and, and nature is upplayed. Um, Amala, on the other hand, is going to be where we may well have those international yacht shows because it's, it's catering for a different market. But so we'll have a lot to offer to different you know, segments of the marketplace. You mentioned the confluence of the other countries. I think the, the thing that we would like to, to sort of dis differentiate ourselves is that we've learned the lessons that others have made, uh, mistakes have made in the past. And so, you know, we're not going to make the same mistakes. We're putting nature at the forefront of everything that we're doing and really showcasing to the world that there's another way to do things, that actually leading the global transformation towards regenerative development. And that's what the Red Sea Project, and indeed all of the, the giga projects in the kingdom, we're all about really showing the world that there's a different way to do things and actually um, really being the, the you know, flag bearers for the future. It's really funny because in my last panel, I was talking um, to the head of the Saudi Tourism Authority, um, Fahad, and we were talking about um, how in this part of the world, and this is not something that's just um, particular to Saudi Arabia by any means, oftentimes you see a lot of mega projects announced, and then they kind of percolate, and then they kind of drift away, and they never are accomplished. And what has been interesting, um, I think, about what the Saudi narrative has been over the last couple of years is that you know, sometimes the projects go quiet, but at the same time, then you'll see another story coming out in the press. Things are continuing to move. Things are continuing to be built. Um, Andrew, when you think about this with regards to Neom in particular, obviously this is just a small part, as you say, the tourism element of the bigger project. 10% um, Saudi Arabia is hoping uh, tourism will make up that in terms of GDP by 2030. Within the Neom narrative, how important is tourism? Oh, it's extremely important. It's such a labour-intensive industry. One third of all our employment by 2030 will be in the tourism and hospitality sector. Your question also about uh, Saudis and local tourism. I think COVID has shown Saudis that they live in a beautiful, magnificent country. And as uh, Melanie and, and Jerry have said, with an untold heritage story, which is, should be globally famous and will be globally famous, I think that we've looked at our numbers and one third of all of the visitors that we have by 2030 will be Saudis, and that'll be retained benefit. I saw a number that Saudis spend something like 24 billion US a year leaving the country, and I think this is a big opportunity for us to retain a lot of that benefit. And also, I think Saudis, when you talk to them, are really passionate about their own country, and this will give them an opportunity to be completely proud, because the world will come and reinforce the view that this is something like no other. Look, I come from a beautiful country, uh, Australia. I ran Tourism Australia, but I'm blown away by the physicality. Neom borders Jordan and Egypt. It's 26,500 square kilometres, um, high mountains, colourful deserts, 450 kilometres of Red Sea coastline, 39 islands. As John said, incredible reefs that are unspoilt. We have, everyone always says, have it all. We genuinely have it all. So tourism will be a very important part of NEOM. I think it's almost soft diplomacy. It's a story we can tell the world, but many other sectors will be important also. 
It's not a difficult sell, Al Ula, Melanie, um, in terms of the visual element of the history as well. I'm um, in the feeling of, of it really being new and untouched um, for so many people around the world. Um, it's Instagrammable, if you will, totally socially, social media friendly. But when you think about this with regards to keeping that area pristine, what's the greatest challenge in your view um, to allowing that to be as uh, pristine as possible and at the same point as accessible as possible? What are you guys doing to ensure that? So I'll talk to access and I'll talk to this whole aspect of keeping it pristine. Um, just in terms of your earlier question, um, we're certainly working on air access, building up to dailies from the major ports in um, Saudi Arabia, Riyadh, Jeddah and Dammam. We have ambitions as well to grow internationally. Um, last year, Flynas as well came on the route temporarily in anticipation of year-round services from later this year, we hope, and obviously Saudi are great partners. Um, so that takes care of the access question, but certainly I think in terms of how we continue as a, a country to um, walk the talk, if you like, when it comes to the environment, I think there's a job to be done to continue to edu educate our communities, um, to um, you know, indulge in best practice when it comes to the development of built infrastructure, hotels, etc. I mean, we're delighted that we have brands like Habitas coming online that very much enshrine in their charter the whole principle of, of sustainability. Um, we have a banyan tree that will launch um, later this year that is going to represent, again, tented accommodation, villas and suites, but all the time espousing, if you like, the right principles when it comes to the environment. This is a question for all the panelists. Obviously, we've seen a lot of media reports about some of the more grandiose plans um, from the Saudi government. Um, is there ever an opportunity for you guys to say, okay, yeah, that sounds really great, but it's just not actually feasible? I mean, I know you report all of you directly to the top guys. So are there times where you're like, yeah, that would be great, but actually these plans might be better? How does that work? How does Can that I discussion start, work? Our I mean, CEO, it's, it's an open discussion, I would imagine. Our CEO, Nadmi and Nassar, who apologize for not being here, calls it mission impossible that's doable. You know, there is no such thing as impossible, I think. And I think that's fantastic that the dreams are big. You know, people questioned Steve Jobs when he first started, didn't he? Look what he created. I think that ambition should be applauded and let's, let's go for it. And that's the attitude I think all these giga projects are taking. Jerry, when you think about the Alduria project specifically, when I was joined you, I think two years ago now, we were there, we were talking about all the brands that you were hoping to bring into the Alderia project, whether they be the F&B um, or, or else. Where are you with that? Who are some of the big names that you've brought in so far and who are you looking to bring? Yeah, I, I'd like to answer that, but before I'd like to go back to something you said, because uh, the Crown Prince is our chairman, doesn't need our praise. He's earned our praise, but he's extremely reasonable. Now, he's a very demanding CEO. Um, you have to stay focused, you have to stay on time. Uh, because he sees the bigger picture, and he's very aware of timing, but he's super reasonable. If you go to him and say, Your Royal Highness, I'm nervous about this, he'll say, what's your view? Who have you studied it with? What is your options? What are you recommending? And then one other little caveat. You see a common denominator from all of us on sustainability, on quality of life, but he is unbelievably disciplined on environmental integrity and preservation of culture and heritage. So on all the projects, but especially the five UNESCO World Heritage Sites, he is fiercely protective of uh, the culture and heritage integrity. Now, with us, we have Central, um, uh, Central Arabia Najda architecture, which was built in the mud, mud straw and you know, you can't mention delay because we know what 2030 is. It's, it's a definitive amount of time. But he said in the last board meeting, I'm willing to give you a few months more if the bricks are the real mud bricks, not stabilized mud bricks. That's how detailed he is to the authenticity. So now we have a board meeting coming up on uh, June 18th. That board meeting is going to be very... Uh, wonderful because that's the board meeting where we announce all the hotel brands, a lot of the hotel brands, a lot of the restaurant brands, because one of our principal districts where you broadcast it from, thank you, is the al district. All new planting, 22,000 trees, new parks, but 19 new restaurants that the Dedea community will have 
and that will open first quarter, the end of the year in the first quarter in trials. So um, we will, we're going to be making those announcements only in a month's time. How has COVID impacted your outlook in terms of the demand picture? Obviously, you've got some pretty strong demand um, coming online domestically, but in terms of international tourism, what's going to bring them to Algeria? Yeah, um, you know, the one thing that the kingdom was exceptional on, and one has to praise the custodian of two holy mosques, uh, uh, King Salman, because on the, on the very successful leadership on the G20, his majesty went on TV early and said that COVID is not a Saudi uh, uh, dilemma. It's a global dilemma. So anyone who was in the kingdom, legally, illegally visiting, they were covered on all COVID, all medical, and the, his majesty set the tone for all the G20 on empathy, on how you look after your society. That became one of the be better models in the world. We also were very strict, as you know, in the kingdom to protect the society, because we had to be very careful up until this point. And I think the kingdom, thanks to our Ministry of Health, Ministry of the Interior, certainly the Crown Prince and the King, did an amazing job. We have pent up demand. Uh, you were there with us when we announced uh, uh, the opening up of Saudi in September, the great Ministry of Tourism, Fahad, that you met is doing an amazing job in the Saudi Tourism Authority. But from a period of September to March, we were doing 55,000 electronic visas a week, just with 49 countries, Macau and Hong Kong. So we know the demand is there. Now we're ready, but what blew our mind, which you said earlier, was the Saudis staying in the country and seeing all the parts of the kingdom. So from a tourism point of view, we flourished. Today, we've already had 100,000 people through. So we're looking forward to getting it back open. What's going to be the greatest challenge there, do you think? Is it just something that all of us globally are really looking to tackle? They've done a really great job of it here in the UAE over the last several months, which is just to somehow find a way to be open and accessible, and yet at the same time have those COVID restrictions in place to a degree, whether it be mask wearing or social distancing like we're doing today, to ensure that you have the safest environment possible. I mean, what is the easiest way, do you think, to go about that in terms of your job? I mean, you're there to make sure that the restrictions that the government sets are, are the policies are implemented, if you will, but at the same time, you're giving the feedback, which is this is going to work, this isn't going to work. John, do you want to take that? No, say the question again. No. So just in terms of you guys are going to take the policy that the government sets forth and implement that, but at the same time have that open door dialogue which says, you know, this is really working, but this isn't really working. I mean, if you're on the Red Sea, does everyone need to wear a mask? What's it going to really look like in your view? Well, look, I, I think this is an evolving, this is an evolving situation. I think the rollout of the vaccine globally is, is pretty amazing. I mean, there's some spots that are not so good, but, but fundamentally all of our source markets you know, by the time that we start to open up our resorts at the end of next year, most of these places are going to be, you know, beyond herd immunity. So I think the, the traveling public is going to come and is predominantly going to be vaccinated. In fact, I, I suspect maybe that's going to be one of the key criteria to, to allow people to come in. And then I think people will, will act sensibly. I think, you know, we, you know, wearing a mask, as you see today, is pretty commonplace, and I think people will continue to respect that until such time as it's you know the all clear is uh, is received. But I'm a, I'm a I'm an, I'm optimistic about the recovery of the market. I think the market is going to come back super strong. There's huge amounts of pent up demand, not just domestically but internationally. I just look at I look at the UK in particular. You know today they've announced the opening up of uh, of travel and. I know charter operators are fully booked up and, you know, wherever they, they're, it's safe to travel to, people are going to travel. And so my expectation is that, you know, there's going to be a very strong recovery in terms of travel and when, when the time is right and people can come here, they're going to come and it's going to be a safe place. We're doing things differently in, in certainly in the Red Sea in that, you know, we were always about building greener and we were always about being less crowded. Overtourism is a, is, has become a, a real problem globally. Uh, especially for certain certain de destinations, where right from the get-go we, we we said to ourselves we would limit the number of visitors at our destination. Now I think that's going to resonate particularly well in a post-COVID world. But we were there before COVID. You know we have a site that's 28,000 square kilometers, and we're going to develop such a small fraction of that. If so, if you think about it in the, in, the, in the country sense, it's almost the size of Belgium, 
and yet we're going to limit the number of visitors to a million visitors. So as I said, I think that's going to play out very well with the traveling public, especially in the early years post the pandemic sort of subsiding. I think people are going to appreciate the fact that they can go to a place that they can be in touch with nature and actually not feel that they're you know, in a very crowded place. You mentioned the UK, and obviously the UAE is still on the red list. Saudi Arabia, however, is not. Do you anticipate that Saudi Arabia are going to pick up some of those tourists from the UK that might have chosen Dubai or Abu Dhabi previously, but now that they can get to Saudi Arabia, do you think they're going to go? Well, look, I think so. I think, I think Saudi Arabia is going to be hugely attractive, as for all of the reasons that uh, you know, my, my fellow panelists have, have already uh, referred to. We've got great history, we've got culture, we've got amazing terrain and topography and scale. Um, and yeah, I, I do. And look, it's a totally different experience. I think the UAE has done a phenomenal job. Dubai is, is amazing. But we're not trying to compete with that. We're offering something totally different. We're offering something that I think in the post-pandemic world is going to resonate more with the traveling public than what existed before. Andrew, what about um, the interest uh, from investors? Obviously, there's a lot of investment opportunity in terms of the hotels, the F&B space. But what are the things that people don't necessarily know are investables today? Uh, from a neon perspective, because we are quite multifaceted, you've seen His Royal Highness the Crown Prince announce the line, a 170-kilometer long uh, city like no other, with no cars, no streets, the spine where there's all the fiber optics and transport, etc. I think investors are really interested. It's a place where at least a million people will live. So, so what that does, it gives you scale, and uh, we, we won't limit the number of people, but like John was saying, 95% of NEOM, 26,000 square kilometers, will not be developed. It's a real focus on keeping it free, we can breathe the air, and I think that's going to be a real selling point for all things NEOM, uh, Neom and all things Giga projects. In terms of investors, people are really interested. I think there's an element of scepticism, to be really honest. They want to see it happen. They want to see the first things come out of the ground, and I applaud everyone in the, on this panel for uh, biting the bullet and developing these things first, uh, using, we've got a common master in the PIF and the Crown Prince, using Saudi money to build the first assets. And I think if we can prove it up and we can build our reputation, there is no doubt there's big investment uh, appetite. You know, John might comment more because he's a bit further advanced, but our view is let's build quality, let's set standards, and then let's see it come, go from there. John, is that fair? Yeah. Look, I, I, I fully agree with you, Andrew. Look, I think up until a certain point, there was a great deal of skepticism. You know, big projects, big announcements, and very little evidence of things actually progressing. The experience that we're now having on the Red Sea is, is, is significant insofar as the discussion with investors has, has picked up a pace. And what, what's led to this has been our commitment to, to plow ahead with the, the heavy lifting, the, the infrastructure. We signed a large-scale public-private partnership, as I mentioned, to build the utilities infrastructure for the destination. We awarded the airport, which is an, under construction. And we've just signed last, uh, you know, in the last couple of weeks, a, a 14.12 billion real green loan facility to fundamentally secure the entire capital structure for the first phase of the development. Now we're being taken extraordinarily seriously, as you would imagine. So now we're engaged in numerous discussions with different investors looking to invest into the, into the commercial assets because, we've, as I said, we've taken care of all the hard, the, the hard yards, the hard work of building infrastructure, which doesn't generate a return. And I see that, that by showcasing a project that is actually coming to fruition is going to bring more of the international investment community here because they're now going to believe there will be proofs of concept that demonstrate that Saudi tourism is, is for real, and it's going to be a meaningful investment opportunity if you're one of the first to uh, participate. Melanie, I wanted to ask you about this specifically with regards to, we're talking about keeping the area pristine. Obviously, this is a new administration in Washington, for example. We're talking about um, COP21. We're talking about, you know, even here in the UAE, we now have um, a climate change czar. And of course, that's Dr. Sultan al Jaber, who's also the head of Abu Dhabi National Oil Company. So this is something that all the Gulf countries are really focused on. Saudi Arabia is focused on it very much as well. When you think about these projects in terms of public-private partnerships, foreign direct investment. Where are the opportunities within Al Ula? So um, in terms of the master plan, which is, as I say, a very ambitious plan for built infrastructure, five core districts with 15 major cultural assets, we will be looking to attract investment globally. 
Um, but, you know, right through, whether it's the regeneration of the cultural oasis, um, you know, uh, resuscitating our agriculture and industries uh, to encourage um, what were really am amazingly advanced water and irrigation management systems that our uh, ancient civilizations used and that we can still learn from today. There are, um, you know, there are opportunities galore for investors in terms of uh, Alola's built infrastructure. We've got a real emphasis on renewables. Um, uh, we're working with hotels to make sure that it's always sustainable materials. And we're talking about being, uh, you know, carbon neutral by 2035. So a very ambitious plan in that space. But I also think coming back to some of the earlier strains of conversation as it relates to COVID, um, you know, we are by definition the great outdoors, majestic landscapes, you know, rocky outcrops juxtaposed with great palm trees. So if there are places to get away and, and enjoy the great outdoors. Saudi Arabia has that in spades. So I've also got to pay tribute to Saudi tourism. Uh, Maggie, I suspect, is in the room as we speak. The, the, her team and Bruno's team have done a big job to help us get awareness established in a lot of our markets. We've had a great campaign to put Saudi Arabia on the map and we at Alula ourselves have launched our first domestic campaign last year, the world's masterpiece, which is really about instilling a sense of pride with Saudis in what is an amazing tourism destination in their backyard. And just before I let you panelists go, um, I want to walk down the, the panel and the line, if you will, virtually as well, um, and get me a sense of the numbers that you're anticipating that are going to happen as a result of Saudi Arabia now opening up, the world increasingly becoming more and more vaccinated. Herd immunity is slowly but surely beginning to happen. Um, what kind of numbers are you anticipating this year in terms of visitors to the kingdom? Who wants to kick off? I can. <laughs> <laughs> Two million tourists by 2035. So a very modest number, but we're looking to position us uh, as a boutique heritage and cultural destination, and we want to be true to that brand ethos. And then uh, in terms of Riyadh, uh, the Crown Prince, and we've published this, uh, 25 million visitors with seven through, uh, uh, through Dedea. We're putting uh, all those concentric master plans in over seven kilometers of three uh, different master plans. Um, so we'll have 30 hotels, 19 in the first phase, hundreds of restaurants and thousands of residents, 6,000 residences, new university, uh, new souks. So uh, we feel we'll, that those numbers will come. And Riyadh is the principal city. It's the, the largest population. We have the critical mass. So uh, we're all very excited about it, but we're working, as you know, around the clock because if the Crown Prince works an 80-hour week, which he does, all of us work an 81-hour week, and uh, we're all very fired up because we know that at least the one thing that came out from the G20 is that a lot of the G20 countries are polarized right now. There's, a, there's a, a latent negativity, but not in the kingdom. The kingdom is very optimistic. It's very positive. So people are fired up right now, and one of the most fun things to talk about is tourism and the fact that we get to show everybody the kingdom and that everybody gets such a warm welcome when they come. But Riyadh will attract 25 million people. John. Well, look, I mean, for us, we're still in the development phase, so, you know, this year we won't expect uh, many visitors. Was, those that are coming are there for, uh, to do construction work, and we'll encourage a lot of them because we, we need them. Um, we have 7,000 workers today, and we're going to probably push to 30,000. Um, we're going to have a softer opening. We're opening three hotels, as I said, at the end of next year. So come 23, we'll start to see the first influx of visitors coming to the Red Sea, and will they'll be counted in the tens of thousands. By the end of the first phase, which is the end of 23, with the full 16 hotels, we expect uh, you know, around the 300, 350,000 visitors per year, and ultimately building up as we complete the project to a million visitors per year. But we're capping it based on our environmental carrying capacity. That's, that's as I said, the most important part, to really ensure that this pristine environment is there for generations to enjoy in the future. Andrew. Uh, I think um, with the ambition of Saudi to more than 100 million, it sounds like Neom's gonna have to do some heavy lifting. I, I agree with John, it's a good idea for these pristine places to cap numbers. We'll be uh, perhaps a bit more open, but I think we've gotta probably move away from just numbers and look at value and what's left behind. And this is the point that a lot of people have made around 
preserving our heritage, regenerating the environment. We want to bring back wildlife that's gone missing in Saudi, the ibex, the oryx, the cheetah, the ostrich. We want to bring the water tables back up, make the wadis beautiful. So I think the value of tourism will be more about how do you regenerate these places for future generations than pure numbers. That said, we will have pure number targets. We're aiming for at least five million by 2030. I get a sense we might be pushed to go a bit harder. And before I let you go completely, what is the biggest challenge, do you think? Is it the lack of alcohol, which I hear through the grapevine might in fact be changing at some point in the near future? Is it uh, geopolitics? Is it potentially, sadly, another wave of COVID-19 like we're seeing now in Asia or India? What is the greatest challenge to getting done what you're trying to get done now? Um, you know, as I said earlier, we're very optimistic. Um, but I've been at this a long time. and. I just want us to make sure that the experience that all the CEOs feel is qualitative because the Crown Prince is insistent on quality. So we're doing an amazing job. If you look at the tourism infrastructure of where it was three years ago and where it is now and exponentially where it will be three years from now, um, I just want to get the 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 kingdom's uh, tourism infrastructure in place to take care of the people that are going to come. I feel very confident that we're on that way, but there's a lot of work to do. We're very focused on it. The Giga projects are one piece of it, but, um, you know, the vaccinations, the COVID, there will be other variants. There'll be other waves. Um, we're not naive. We understand uh, some of the geopolitics. Uh, we understand that there's some uh, boring... Um, old stereotypes that have to be uh, dispelled, which we're all doing, that Saudi Arabia is only deserts and camels and that people are not welcoming. Well, when we opened up from a period from September to March, the Saudi Tourism Authority, the post uh, uh, interviews, we had no idea how beautiful the country was. We had no idea how welcoming. That, that will get out quickly. So I think we just have to ramp up, but fortunately the Crown Prince has given us all the resources to do that. So it's just physics of time to get ready faster than maybe other G20 uh, tourism profiles have. John? Look, I share, I share some of Jerry's thoughts on um, you know, building the human capital, the infrastructure to support the, the, this huge expansion of the tourism industry in a country where tourism has not featured significantly, certainly in terms of its share of the, uh, of the economy. Um, but we, we, you know, we're fortunate to have great support from the very top, from the leadership, but also from all the main ministries. I mean, obviously, Ministry of Education, um, the Ministry of Tourism, um, who are all behind this initiative to really get the training happening today in order to be ready for when we start to welcome our guests. I think the biggest challenges that I face or biggest concerns is really not to screw up the place. I hate that at the end of the day, my environment, our environment, is what is our most valuable asset. And so it's making sure that I balance the, the desire and the need to build and to build it in a timely fashion, but never to, to the extent where I put at risk the very thing that is going to make this place so special and so unique. And so that's what uh, I focus on. Andrew? No, I agree with John. Um, I think just getting the workers, because we're all constructing, there's a lot of gigas, that's big. I think tourism is young in Saudi, so as Jerry and John have alluded to, helping train uh, people and get that service culture going is really important. I, I work with a lot of young Saudis. They are so keen, they are so enthused, they are so clever, they are so passionate. I have no doubt that all of us will end up bottling an Arabian service culture, which will be the equal of anything in the world, but that will take time. So I think that's a big challenge. And, you know, just getting it done in the time frame with so much going on. but. It's an exciting challenge. And look, you know you know the numbers, but what is it, 65% of Saudis are under the age of 35. There's this huge energy and huge passion to want to do it. So I have no doubt we'll scale that mountain. Melanie. I agree with the panel. I think um, Saudi has to live up to um, the expectations of the most discerning traveler when it comes to service. And we will definitely have um, you know, some hard yards to fulfill there. But I also think as a marketer, that um, the health of our source economies in terms of our markets, and I use the word health 
the double entendre is very critical. At the end of the day, tourism is a unifier, but consumer confidence in being able to do that travel is really critical. And I think it will be telling in the next few years and months to see how that evolves. How do you see consumer confidence today? I think uh, from a travel perspective, very depending on markets, very depending upon the influence of the pandemic and the scared factors associated with it. But I do think that with all of us in Saudi, certainly having a very measured approach to safety um, and uh, you know, a country that by its definition lends itself to the big outdoors, whether you think our heritage spaces or indeed um, uh, some of our other locations, our pristine blue assets that John has talked about so beautifully, um, I think there's a lot to be optimistic about. Panelists, we're gonna leave it there. Thank you all so much for joining us at the Arabian Travel Market. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Only one today. Uh.